Hello, 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 everybody. Happy Saturday. I have to say it's really strange right now. I've done so many Zoom events this week that just talking into the camera and not seeing everyone's faces um, uh, it seems weird. I feel like I should be admitting people into the waiting from the waiting room into the thing and um, you know, texting everybody that didn't get the link, but um, this um, makes it simple. Uh, so welcome, welcome everybody. We are in the Piedmont region of Italy. I almost said France. Uh, I really do know where I am, I promise. Really excited to be here tonight and taste these incredible wines. So as a quick backdrop, first of all, go ahead. Don't wait any longer. Pour some of this wine into your glass. Uh, we're going to start with this one and we'll, we'll talk about the wine in just a second as we introduce, but go ahead and pour yourself a glass of that. Cheers, everybody to this amazing wine and this great class, sharing it with everybody. So um, a little backdrop in industry insider information. When, when in Virginia, it's a three-tier distribution state. So that means me as a retailer, I have to purchase wine from an importer or distributor, sometimes it's both, uh, sometimes it's just one, sometimes the other, they purchase wine from a winery, either direct, and they were considered now a distributor and an importer, or they go through importers. We're gonna talk about the importance and unimportance of importers as we go through these wines, because each wine is brought in by a different importer and uh, what that means when you're shopping for wine in a wine store. Often, some of these very boutique producers, like we are featuring tonight, they are only releasing a very small amount of wine. So to make sure it's going to the right place and not sitting in a warehouse somewhere, you know, getting stale, not that it gets stale, but you know what I mean, they will release what they call an allocation to the distributor, saying like, here's what, we, what you purchased last year from us, here's what we can give you this year, and then that distributor, to make sure that all of that isn't going to sit in their warehouse, will send offers to their buyers to see if their buyers want to buy the wine in advance. So this wine hasn't been released yet. Wine hasn't like hasn't even made it over the mm -hmm. you know the waters yet. But all of these offers kind of get negotiated between the winery, the importer, and the distributor, or sometimes the winery directly to the distributor. Then that distributor contacts all the buyers like me and says, here's a list of all the wines. If you order in advance, we're talking like six months in advance sometimes, then you get a better price. No, you can't taste the wine because it hasn't made it to the US yet. So it's kind of this risk. Um, but if you understand the brands, if you are familiar with the wineries, if you know that you like all of their wines, then it's a then it's you know perfect because I get a cheaper product and I get to pass that discount on to you. As long as I know in six months, I can get rid of all of this wine and it not be sitting on my shelves. Nobody in the wine world wants wine sitting on shelves anywhere. So the idea is to get wine to you at the best rate, the best possible like value, and um, to make sure that you're getting kind of exclusive wines. So some of these wines, I am familiar with the producer. Um, the second third and fourth and fifth. So yes, all of these wines, I've had wines from them before. All of these producers, I've had some of their wines before. None of these wines have had the vintages before. And this time is the first time that the La Mirage is actually even available in the United States. So um, that's kind of the backdrop of what this is all about. So I've been talking about these wines for a long time, the final in, and no, these wines are not necessarily ready to drink yet. They will be, um, but some of these wines are available. You can buy them now, tasting them, knowing what they hopefully will taste like and be a good value to lay down and hold on to for the next couple of decades. Some of these wines will age that long. So it's kind of the story of what this is all about and why that this amazing package of wine is so cheap for you today. Because I pre-bought these wines without having tasted them back in August. That's the story. I will let you know next time in August when I'm doing this, now that I have kind of a more built up clientele, I can send that offer to you too. You can also buy the wines on pre-sale. So that helps me figure out what I'm gonna be able to buy, helps the distributor, the importer, and the winery. Everyone likes selling things in advance. 
So that's the story. Now I'd like to hear where you are coming from. I think everybody's tuned in now. Just chat in the jump in the chat room and tell us where you're coming from. Tawana, hello, hello. Uh, Sam Mom and Sam Pop coming from right across the table. So exciting to be able to share wines, not just with myself looking at a computer. I love being able to taste these wines with my parents. Um, Jake and Cora coming from Norfolk. Happy Valentine's Day indeed. Um, I believe that um, that you all are my Valentine's dates and I appreciate that, so thank you. Steph Dressel coming from Monterey, California. So great to see you. Steph, did you get any wines from Piedmont at stores out there? I know um, these wines weren't weren't out there yet, but um, hopefully you've got some fun Italian wines in your glass. Tell me what you're drinking so I know. Amanda from Williamsburg and John, great to see y'all. And another Amanda and Matt from Portsmouth, great to see you as well. Um, Chris coming from Virginia Beach, Green Alino, yes. Uh, Rick Morrison from Williamsburg, great. Oh, fabulous, you got three similar, awesome. I'm so excited uh, when we get to that point, tell us what you're, like what the brands are. Um, I'd love to know what you're, what you're tasting, so. And Kevin and Emma in Norfolk, fabulous. Um, so, Let's go ahead and we've got five, some of, some of you guys have five wines to taste because um, we added that on that Barolo. So I'm going to try my best to kind of give us some grandiose information, a grandiose summary information of Italian wine, why Piedmont is special. And then we're gonna get into the nitty gritty details of these insanely amazing producers. Um, this is our map right here. So you can see, if this is the map of Italy, you see my uh, my wine stain maps. Um, I feel like wine notes aren't legit until you've, you've spilled some wine on them. I fully believe that. So here's the whole map of Italy. Piedmont is all the way in the north. Now, if you're gonna say it in Italian, you would say Piemonte. So you can say that for the rest of the class. I try and make things a little bit more approachable for everyone here in the States. So you notice I generally do not use the European names for some of these regions because it just makes it a little bit more confusing, harder to pronounce, and, and difficult to understand. But Piemonte is just the Italian name for Piedmont, so they are synonymous. This is a zoomed up map of Piedmont, and it's a very confusing map because unlike the Loire Valley or almost any other wine region, in Piedmont, each of these wine regions is kind of superseded on top. So this tiny little region sits within and kind of above this other region, within kind of above this larger region. They're all kind of part of each other. So it's a very difficult map to, um, I guess, to, to print out very easily. But this is the best one I found. There's only one update that hasn't been updated on here. We'll talk about that when we get to the, uh, when we get to the Dolcetto. So, what makes Italian wine specifically so unique from other European wine countries? And by the way, like sip away this first wine um, as I go through this beginning information. So what makes Italian wine so unique from other European wine regions is that it is so regionalistic. So France is not very regionalistic. I mean, they are, but definitely the least so of all of Europe. So they had Napoleon. He was the great unifier. He was a very strong nationalist, created a French identity. Spain, very regionalistic and um, very, very different. Obviously every year there's referendums on whether or not different areas are gonna secede and become their own country, different languages and cultures and food types. But in terms of the wine, there's a little bit more um, um, continuity between the wine styles and wine making practices throughout Spain because of what Franco did um, and, and, and different different eras basically from the mid 1800s through the 1900s you have a little bit more continuity of wine styles throughout all of spain italy though there's no continuity of wine styles of flavors of food of culture of anything so very drastically different if you think about it where we are in piedmont you can stand on the soils and see the the swiss alps on the further south coast of of Italy, you can stand on the coast and see North Africa. So you imagine the the difference, the wide array of differences, not only in terms of wine, but also in terms of climate and thus food, uh, culture. For instance, they use olive oil in the south. They actually don't use olive oil in the north where we are. They use butter, so it's a little bit more French in style. 
There is uh, no tomatoes really used in the north. It's, tomatoes is a very southern thing. They weren't even introduced into Italy until the mid 1800s. All of this stuff just changes drastically the food. And specifically for Italy, wine is food. Food is wine. You cannot, should not ever have wine without food or food without wine. They go hand in hand from breakfast till dinner till after dinner. If you go to Italy and order a glass of wine, you will never get just a glass of wine. Even if you don't order food, it will come with a small plate of something to snack on. Now, yes, wine and food go together and it's a very European thing. But that, that general marriage of wine and food that's so lovely throughout all of Europe is inextricably linked in Italy in a way that cannot be separated. So wine is food, food is wine in Italy. So drastically, I guess a more, um, a more intense way of looking about the food and wine pairing. So the local foods are meant to go with the local wines. And because they're so regionalistic, Every little village throughout the 20 different states of Italy focuses on a different grape variety that is really only grown in one village, some of these wines. So you have about 1,500 grape varieties grown throughout Italy. Those are indigenous grape varieties to Italy. So instead of the French varieties, which have become known as the international grape varieties, think Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Chenin Blanc, Riesling, all of these things are considered international grape varieties because really cultivated and became famous in France and has spread throughout the entire world um, and, and grown many other places. Very, very, very few other indigenous Italian grape varieties are grown anywhere else. Yes, you can say, oh, well, there's this Virginia winery I know that makes a Nebbiolo or I've had Sangiovese from California. But by and large, that is the infinitesimally small percentage of those wines are coming from anywhere else other than Italy. So that is another reason that makes Italy so unique. So now let's talk about Piedmont specifically. So Piedmont's the furthest north region of Italy. So you have very cool climate, shadow of the Swiss Alps. You have, should have to go lower in elevation to get to regions that are warm enough to grow grapes because Piedmont includes some of these very, very high elevation mountainous areas that are just too cold to grow grapes, to, to cultivate vines. So Piedmont is different in that. It's much different in terms of food as well. So again, all that butter, think risotto instead of spaghetti. Think truffles, truffle mushrooms, not chocolate truffles. Think um, parpadel, think everything that goes in mushroom cream sauces instead of your typical southern olive oil fish. There's wild boar, not fish. All of these differences is in, um, in food and differences in wine. One of the other final big differences of Piedmont wines are they generally are not blended. Everywhere else you go in Italy, you, you find blends. Even if it says it's the Sangiovese, they're usually adding 15% other grape varieties in there. So 90 for, I'd say, let's say, let's call it 90 percent of all other Italian red wines specifically is a blend of multiple different grape varieties. In Piedmont, they're all single varieties. Yes, there's some people experimenting with some blends, but for the most part, most wines, most red wines from Italy, white wines too, sorry, red wines and white wines from Piedmont are not blended. They're varietal wines. Varietal meaning it's made from one variety, one grape variety. That's what makes Piedmont so different. So language, culture, food, how they make wine. And uh, yes, the, that's kind of like basic, basic history. So up until the mid nineties, basically, um, you had wines that were made in a very rustic, intense way that they were telling you if you're buying some of these wines that we're gonna be drinking tonight, if you buy them, you need to wait at least 10 to 15 years before you should ever drink them just because the way that they were making the wines. So by the mid nineties, things have changed by the mid eighties. Like that's, that's, that's when the first kind of crest of the wave started happening of modern winemaking techniques using different types of oak. We'll get into that using um, pump overs instead of, uh, instead of full skin contact. We'll get into all of those things. But modern winemaking techniques start to be coming into Piedmont area, Northern Italy in general, by the mid 80s. 
So by the 90s, now we're finally starting to see wines that are approachable at less than 15 years old. Thank God, because if I sold you this four pack of wine and said, hi guys, put 15 years, a Saturday night in 2036, we're going to be doing this virtual class. Um, obviously not as fun as being able to get the wines right away and drink them. Tomorrow's not promised if we have learned anything in the last year. So that's just kind of the basic history of Piedmont. Now we're going to get into these wines. I think everybody has tuned in now. So I'm Carrie and Sully from Blast Light Hotel. I hope it's gorgeous and fabulous. Lisa and Dana, welcome to the tribe. I think this is y'all's first time. Very, very, very excited to have y'all. Uh, Jason, oh, sorry, knocking, knocking cups over. At least that one was empty. Jason, Shane, Johnny in Newport News. Great to see y'all as well. I think this is your first virtual class as well. So, so excited to have um, an increase of tribe members interested in learning more about wine. I'm thrilled to have you all. All right, let's start talking about this first wine, Grignolino. I had to start off with something weird because I'm Kira. So Grignolino is how this wine is pronounced. The first G is hard. The second G is totally silent. So it's not Grignolino. It is green Yolino. Green like the color. Yo, like yo, what up? Um, lean, like uh, we all wanted to get lean in January. I didn't succeed. And then, oh, green Yolino is how that is pronounced. Um, and y'all should all remember that, <laughs> that story. Um, came up with that one on the fly. So green Yolino is the name of the grape. This is definitely not one of the most famous grapes of Piedmont. So the rest of the grapes we're gonna be tasting, very famous. Nebbiolo is kind of the king of Piedmont, the most famous, the most sought after, she called it the queen, um, but it's very masculine in style. Barbera, I would consider the queen. So it's a little bit more feminine style, a little bit more approachable, less of those intense tannins of Nebbiolo that will taste later. Dolcetto is like the little sister. So usually kind of like flirtatiously styled wine, if that could be a thing. Um, it's juicier. It's usually not aged in oak. It's a very lighthearted, carefree, delightful wine um, meant for like more like table wine, quaffing wine. Now it's made a little more seriously, as we'll see soon. But Grignolino used to be very famous, like back in the 1800s, if anyone remembers back in that day. In fact, Grignolino prices rivaled the prices of Barolo, so the king of the regions of Nebbiolo. And um, it just fell out of fashion. So wines do that sometimes. It used to be that first growth Bordeaux from France that we now consider some of the most expensive wines in the whole world. They were like pennies on the dollar. And these sweet wines coming from Hungary were the most expensive wines in the entire world. It was like the gold standard. So wines come in and out of fashion, and it really is economics 101. The supply and the demand creates the pricing structure. Now Grignolino is not frequently grown. If it is, it's usually kept to a small amount of producers to make a small amount of wine. This is only the fifth Grignolino I've ever had in my entire life, and that includes one random Grignolino that is grown by Height Cellars in California, the only non-Italian Grignolino I've ever even heard of. So really excited to taste this. What is Grignolino? Grignolino is this berry that has a very, very thin skin. So that's why the color is so pale. You can even see like on camera how pale this color is. You can easily read through it. It's one of the palest concentration wines, red wines I've seen. It looks like a Spanish rosé. It is so pale and brownish in color too. So the skins of the grapes themselves are very thin. So that's where the color from grapes comes from. And if you don't have thick skin, you're not gonna impart a lot of color to the wine. However, Grignolino comes from the local dialect, a word, an ancient word, I can't remember what the original word is, but it translates to pips. Pips is the name for the seeds of the berries of the, of the grapes themselves. And Grignolino, this type of grape, has three to four times the amount of seeds as a normal grape does. For whatever reason, just happened genetically that that's what this grape is all about. So tannins from red wine, that drying sensation in your mouth, comes from not only the skin of the grape, but the seed of the grape as well. So granulino, while it is the most pale in concentration, the most pale in pigment of most of almost any red wine I've ever had, has tannins of this serious 
big boy red wine. So it makes that a really juxtaposition, a really fun, a really, really different style of red wine. Very high in acid too, so it's a really refreshing wine. If they're not aged in oak, you can even put them down in the refrigerator for a little bit and have a red wine that you could serve with fish or a red wine that can serve outside in the summer because of the higher acid and it's generally an oak style of being made, then you can serve it with a slight chill on it. So that's the deal with Green Alino. Just to explain some of these wine labels, each one will have to be explained, but Piedmont's tricky because sometimes the wine is named from the grape, sometimes the wine is named from the region, like Barolo is named for the region. It is only made of Nebbiolo grape, but it is called Barolo, not Nebbiolo. Barbera is always named for the grape. And if a wine was named for the grape, you usually will see the grape name itself, then D apostrophe the next word. The next word is usually the city or village or township that the vineyards come from, that area comes from. So this is Grignolino Diasti. If you've ever heard of this very unfamous wine called Moscato Diasti, Moscato is the grape coming from the same area, Asti. So Asti has definitely became way more famous because of Moscato and it's crazy skyrocketing sales in the US for Moscato Diasti. And they make a lot of red wines as well. On the map here, and then I want your tasting notes on this wine. Two, let's see here. So two cities right here. We have Asti and Alba. So Asti to the north, Alba to the south. Alba is considered, I guess, like the higher quality of the two in terms of the vineyards that surround it. Um, but Asti and Alba are definitely the two most important cities or villages in Piedmont, Italy for making really high quality wine. So this is Grignolino di Asti. And now I want to hear your thoughts on this very different wine. Has anyone ever had a different a wine quite like this or had a Grignolino before? I know Chris said that you had a Grignolino before. You love it. Anyone else has, have you had Grignolina before? I, um, it's, I used to serve it by the glass at the restaurant I worked at and it was so fun. People would always be like, can I have a glass of that Grignolina? And, um, and Grignolino, that's how we gotta say it with the, with the accent and all. So what are you smelling? What are you tasting? How do you envision yourself enjoying this wine? Would you drink it with a slight chill with some fish? smoked salmon or something like that, or even like poached salmon on mushroom risotto. It's exactly what I want right now. Um, but tell me your thoughts on this wine. So mom, what do you think of this wine? Mm. It's surprising spice notes to it. I wasn't, you know, on the, um, as it sits in your mouth, the spices come. Yeah. Out. So some mom says really mm. surprising spice notes on the wine. So as it sits on the palate, like baking spices, there's some like cinnamon and nutmeg and clove mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. Also with these like pungent floral notes, dried rose petals and um, like lavender and rosemary, all of these like herbs, but the floral aromatic herbs, just really fascinating. So um, Chris says, Heights, awesome. The Grignolina from California, one of your favorites, fabulous. Um, hello, Chris and Heather from Williamsburg, glad to have you. Um, <laughs> and Papa, I don't know. Will you be senile in 15 years? Probably. Yes, he will. He's going to outlive us all. Um, all right. So Amanda says, first time tasting green Alino. She says, wonderful, bright cherry. The color and clarity are so bright. Yes. The color, clarity, and flavor of this wine is so bright. It's kind of making my mouth water. It's mm -hmm. such a refreshing wine. Um, really fascinating. Tawana says, very contradictory wine. Yes, it is quite the juxtaposition. Getting red ripe cherry, loads of it, with white or green peppercorn on the nose. Yeah, so you got those baking spices and you actually have pepper spice as well. And on the palate, the tannins are way more intense than I expected. Yeah, so it's extra seeds, baby. They are tannic. Um, would definitely serve chilled with fish, Shane says. Yes, totally agree with this one. The notice is pretty pine tree. Yes, there's a lot of alpine notes that come from more rustic versions of uh, red wines from Piedmont and some white wines too that I find in this area. So I must get a little bit more of this pine tree quality. So um, I like it. 
Definitely have florals, but not offensive floral. Totally, totally agree. It's not like perfumey or um, or sickening at all. So John thinks it's herbaceous. Great. So we've got floral notes, spice notes, herb notes, fruit notes, so much going on. Trees in general. So much is going on in this really light and refreshing wine. So pretty dope. Totally, totally agree there. Raspberry. Love that call. Um Yes, there's all this cherry too, but there's other of this like wild raspberries, wild strawberries, wild red things. Red berries, great, love it. Reminded us of a, a bit of a light Beaujolais. Yeah, that that very red fruited style wine with that light body. Um, and smelling the strawberry, love it. Oh my gosh, the tasting notes are outrageous for this wine, aren't they? They just keep going. Taste baking spices and tart red cherry, but we smell some really faint tobacco. Love that call. So we're getting those herb notes. Definitely great call on that tobacco. Like really good pipe tobacco. Um, I've never actually smoked a pipe, but I love the smell of pipe tobacco. That sweeter style. So first time, Chris says, uh, love the refreshing quality. Heather picks up spices and strawberries on the nose. And easy drinking, Cora says. Fabulous. All right. This is really fascinating. So this, as we finish up this, I'll um, just wrap this up since we've got plenty of other wines to taste and tell you a little bit about this producer. So this estate is actually kind of built into this castle that was built in the 11th century. It was uh, like an armory, um, a castle and an armory. And then it was re-retrofitted in the 14th century, you know, just in peace, like 400, 300 years later into a cellar itself. So they've taken it over and now 600 years later, more than that, um, there is a winemaker, his name is Eugenio, 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 yes, Eugenio, there we go, um, Gatti, and he's a seventh century, not seventh century, oh my gosh, seventh generation viticulturalist. So that means for seven generations, his family has been working vineyards. That's what a viticulturist means. So not necessarily winemaking for seven, cent seven generations, but tending the vineyards, really focusing on the farming aspect of it for seven generations. So they know the land really well. So this is a tiny little vineyard. He makes uh, very, very, very small amounts of this wine. On the back of this tag, I talk about... Um, or in the email, I talked about 850 total cases of wine. I was mistaken. That is 850 cases of their top tier higher end wines. But overall, he's like less than 2,000 cases total. So still, still by all means, a very, very tiny producer. But this wine specifically is about 500 case production. Anything less than like... 30,000 cases is considered a boutique winery. So we're in like the Uber boutique of the Uber boutique here with all of these wines. So Grignolino, they harvest everything by hand. They de-stem it before they start the fermentation process because the stems of the grape clusters will add tannins to the wine. And if you already have a lot of tannins in the grape seeds or skins themselves, you don't want to add the stems. So that's why Cabernet, you never add stems from the from the grape clusters themselves when you're making Cabernet, because the Cabernet grape itself has enough tannins. But you might add it stems to, say, a Pinot Noir. It has a little bit softer tannins. You want to give it a little bit more structure. So this wine is all stainless steel fermented and aged, so no oak at all. All of those tannins are just coming from the grape seeds themselves. Really fascinating. I think this wine could easily age for five to seven years because of its higher levels of acidity and tannins. They act as like a preservative to the wine. And the wine is only, I remember right, yeah, 13% alcohol. 13 to 13.5 is considered like the key range for having wines that will age for a really long time. So highly recommend getting this bottle at your price. Now I only have a couple cases available but I do all of these wines first come first serve. So if you're interested for you, for tonight's att class attendees only, the wine is just 20 bucks. And I have a few cases that I can uh, get my hands on. But after that, it's done until next year. So that's the wine. So glad y'all had a really good um, reaction to it uh, and really amazing tasting notes. We are going to, I know, we don't think we could hold it that long. You're right. I, 
I wouldn't say so either, but if you're interested in aging wine, this would be something that you could age. You wouldn't have to like drink it right away because it's gonna go bad or anything like that. Let's go ahead and jump now to wine number two. We are drinking the Bolskis is how this is pronounced. So a CH in Italian is not a CH sound. It's actually like a hard C, a K sound. So Bolskis, uh, Francesco. His name is actually Francesco Bolskis, but he labels it Bolskis Francesco just because the Italians have got to make it all confusing for us. A really uh, amazing local artist does all their labels for them, all these wild strawberries that grow uh, within the vineyards, actually in between the vineyards and stuff like that. There's, this area is kind of known for that. So that is what we're going to try in our glass number two, wine number two. And, oh, ah, all of these wines are so good. I've been looking forward to this class for so long. So, um, all right, contain my excitement. So this area, we are now in this furthest south region right here. So this kind of like sage green foot that comes out of the rest of the, the main growing areas. The area is called um, uh, Dolcetto Doliani. And that is where we are, I'm sorry, um, we are just further north of that. So their their vineyards straddle both of these um, both of these areas right here. So, but this one that we are drinking actually comes from the Doliani vineyards. So right to the south. Now this area called Doliani. Now remember again, the middle G is silent for this word. So it's not Dogliani, but Doliani. So do a deer, um, Liani. Um, that's that's all I got for you. So Dolcetta de Doliani. Doliani is a region that is nestled right in the key areas of making Barolo, the most famous, the most sought after for Nebbiolo. But the areas are way too cold for Nebbiolo to ripen all the way. Nebbiolo, we'll talk about it later, but it's a late ripening grape. So if it doesn't have enough time to ripen, and if it's too cold to kind of get that extra last little bit, last little spurt, it doesn't ripen all the way. And so it tastes terrible. So Doliani, a little bit too cold for that. Dolcetto ripens a lot earlier than Nebbiolo, and so it can thrive in these colder, higher elevation areas of Doliani. In the areas of Doliani, that is the only grape that is grown. So if it's labeled Doliani, it's 100% Dolcetto. It cannot be blended, cannot be mixed, cannot be any other grape at all. It has to be 100% Doliani. Now, if you see a Doliani Superiore, that generally indicates that the wine was aged, most likely in some oak, but it has to be aged for at least a year before release. They make an oak style dolcetto that's really serious, really kind of got these like brooding, intense tannins to go along with the rustic flavor profile of dolcetto, but this is not their oak style. So I wanted to really express the flirtatious, lighter style, fruit forward, kind of crunchy, um, style of unoaked dolcetto. So Pianezzo is the name of the actual label itself. So just like if I made five different wines, they would come from different regions. So this is me, the producer, this is the region it comes from. And then I might label one um, something and another one something. So it's not specifically the vineyard, but it's the label. The label itself is named after the hill that the vineyard sits on. It's not the name of the vineyard, just the name of the hill but it's a famous hill. So a little bit confusing, again, how uh, all of these wines are labeled and each label that we're gonna be tasting today has a little bit of a different story on why it's labeled like that. So bear with me. The real focus is what is in this glass and does it taste amazing? So Boskis um, has been around, let's see, for, uh, I gotta look at my notes here, um, shoot. I'm not sure exactly they've been around for what time, what when they established their vineyards, but or their their estate. But it's a husband and wife team that work with their two sons. So it truly is like a family farm operation. Tiny little area. We're talking less than. Hold on. With all of these more technical information, I don't want to give you the wrong information. So bear with me for like the only class I'm looking at notes for. But I want to make sure I get this. So we've got about 10 hectares. Okay, so there are 10 hectares of state, so that's about, 
23, 24 acres. So very small estate again. They really focus on Dolcetto. They make a couple other wines, but their primary focus is really on Dolcetto. This is their flagship wine, and they've got some other oak-aged wines, some more serious Dolcetto. One of their vineyards actually in this area comes from, or doesn't come from, the, vi the vines that are growing there have been around since before the 1850s. So in the 1850s, throughout all of Europe, we have phylloxera, that little louse that came over from the Americas, the really obnoxious louse that ate away all of the vines and destroyed literally 99% of all European vines. Then have to be replanted, grafted on top of root stock from the new world, from the United States now, as we call it. That'll be a separate class talking about grafting and phylloxera and the whole thing. Just know that to have vineyards that have been around since before phylloxera ever came into Europe, that have been on their own rootstock, so not grafted, not replanted since then, is really rare. There's only a few places throughout. Um, there's some in Italy, we've got some in Greece, uh, some in Barossa, Australia, a couple in California, and all of Chile, actually, as well. Um, and they'll, they're calling it pre phylloxera vineyards. So meaning before the 1850s when phylloxera devastated the wine world and honestly the global economy that, that revolved around that. So some of the oldest vineyards around here and within their 10 acres of vineyards or 10 hectares of vineyards, they have some of the most like prized vineyards of Dolcetto. So if you talk about Dolcetto, you have to talk about Doliani. If you talk about Doliani, the region, Boskis comes to mind if you're if you're in the wine world if we're talking about who are the standard bearers of really amazing Dolcetto and this is definitely one of them. So this particular hill, the Pianezzo Hill, that these vineyards sit on, has a um, an exposure that faces south. And why does that matter? Why do people talk about well this vineyard sits on a southwest exposure? It's all about when the sun hits the vineyard as it's rising and how long that vineyard has sunlight throughout the day. If you're in a really hot area, maybe you don't want full sunlight all day. So if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, very far north, directly south is gonna get you kind of exposure all day long. If you have Southeast exposure, you kind of get the morning sunlight, but as it heats up there after the noon, it kind of cools down because you're not getting direct sunlight anymore. Versus Southwest exposure stays cool in the morning, but then you get all that afternoon sun. So in cooler areas where you need a little bit more sunlight to provide that photosynthesis that's gonna ripen those grapes, then south, Southeast or Southwest exposure is the key to making sure that those grapes ripen all the way. Now up until mid 90s, Everyone is searching for these vineyards that face south that are a little bit lower elevation so that it's not so cold so your grapes can ripen all the way. What we're seeing now is uh, the forgotten vineyards that no one really cared about, higher elevation, those a little bit too cold, or, or maybe they're west-facing exposure or north-facing exposure, so very cold. Uh, everyone's searching for those now because they're trying to make more elegant wines, and that's really difficult with rising temperatures. So it's really fascinating to see in the last 25 years specifically, the key vineyards are starting to shift as people are looking for cooler sites without as much direct sunlight. So little, little off topic there, but there we go. So this again, stainless steel fermented and then aged uh, stainless steel as well. So there's no oak at all in any of this. And um, we've got only about 900 cases of this wine produced. So again, very, very small. This is like their key wine. This is the wine that they make the most of, and it's only 900 cases produced. They let the skins sit with the wine for a week. So grapes come in, they process it, meaning they like pick all of the grapes that they want, throw all the grapes that they don't want out, it goes in either with stems, if you're gonna keep the stems on, or de-stem into these big tanks. Those tanks then start to come together. It's not whole clusters anymore. They start to burst and make the wine, either by humans stomping them like I did in Oregon, if y'all have heard those stories, or by punching down um, with these long poles, and it looks like a metal disc on the bottom, a metal plate with some holes in it, like a colander, and you can punch down the grapes to kind of burst them to create all that juice that you want. The longer that juice, that must, sits on the skins of the grape, 
The more of that color extraction you're gonna get, the more of the tannins you're gonna get from the skins, more of that flavor. So some wines are gonna go through a three week process or four week process to get as much of that. Those are your really intense wines. Some of the lighter style wines like this one only need about a week on the skins to get that level of flavor. Now, if you look at the color though, this is only a week on the skins. It is wild how dark in concentration this one, is, especially in comparison to the last one. Only a week on the skins, which by the way, the Greenolino had a week on the skins as well. Um, but this is the color that comes out of this. And that is because the skins of Dolcetto are the opposite of Greenolino. So really thick skinned berries. So they were obviously the middle child and um, gotten made fun of all their growing up. So they developed a thick skin and, um, <laughs> and that allowed them to survive the genetic pool and continue to be remain growing in Piedmont. So thick skin grape varietal can take a joke and, um, but not make one. <laughs> Anyways, off topic. So dolcetto comes from the word little sweet one in Italian, not because the wines are made in a sweet style at all, but because the grapes themselves, even though they've got a really thick skin, and kind of create that, that intensity of color and some of tannin as well. The juice itself has a higher sugar content. So the grapes are really sweet, really delightful, but the wines are always made dry. I'm sure there's someone out there not making a, a dry dolcetto. I'd love to try it, but for the most part, dolcetto is made into a dry wine. Love your thoughts on this wine, how radically different it is from the Grignolino. <sighs> It's so crazy. So to me, if there's if there's three words that I could use to describe literally all of these wines that we're tasting, because I've been sipping on these all week uh, with the Corbin. Cherry across the board is in all of these wines. Floral notes are in all of these wines, but again, really reserved, not that perfume style. And elegant. I just um so. If, you, if you're trying to win points or anything like that, anytime I ask for tasting notes and you name any of those three for any of these wines, I will, I will be on your side. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Trying to find where I am in the, in the chat room here. Amanda says, number two reminds me of Mezcal, really smoky and bold, yeah. I like that call that um, um, that like scotchy, smoky, peaty kind of characteristic. That's really interesting. So Rick says, what does that say about the soil to have pre phylloxera vines? Great question. So volcanic soil deposits. So throughout Piedmont, you do have some volcanic soil deposits in Boca, which we will try in two wines, um, and in Doliani as well. Generally speaking, throughout Piedmont, you have more sandy soils, clay, limestone, but there are definitely pockets of volcanic soil. The pH balance and the way the, the volcanic soils will not retain water, so provide extra drainage, doesn't provide an environment that phylloxera likes at all. So throughout Chile, the super sandy soils of Chile doesn't like it. Santorini. Volcanic soils doesn't like it. Canary Islands, volcanic soils doesn't like it. So those two things specifically really create an environment that phylloxera really does not like. Great question. Thank you for letting me clarify that. Um, see, Tawana says, loving the color on the Dolcetto. Yeah, it's almost like magenta-ish or fuchsia coloring. Jam on the nose. Yeah, especially compared to like the really dried kind of bitter notes on the nose on the last one. Jam and grass on the taste and a bit tan finish. Uh, not sure what you mean there. If you want to clarify, that would be great. Tawana says getting raisinated cherries on the nose. Okay. With more jammy fruit on the palate. Yes. This, the fruit condition on these two ends could not be more different between the green Yolino and this. Uh, Tawana says I'm picking up hints of licorice, maybe anise or some other baking spice. I like that call. Um, there's some like Thai basil, some like that herbal style of licorice. Really enjoyed that note. Um, could drink this almost every day. Yes, I totally agree with you. I could as well. Um, when I was tasting wines, when I first got the wines in, I, it was 8.30 in the morning when I started tasting because I just had to, I had to taste these wines. And yeah, I could drink them not 
every day, not even just every day, but all day as well. So get the licorice, Carrie says, awesome. Amanda says vanilla and spice on the nose, black pepper and black fruit taste, bitter finish. Yeah, so all of the red fruity qualities that we got on the first one, similar fruits sometimes. We get the berries, we get the cherries, um, but instead of raspberries, they're blackberries. Instead of red plums, they're black plums. So definitely more of that darker, richer black fruits on there. And dried fruits. So we got dried fruit, we got jenny fruit, stewed fruit, raisinated fruit, smoky, just, just a wildly different wine too. Steve says, I know the Italians always have food with their wine, but I don't want to miss any of this taste. Great, great point there. So wine makes food better and food makes wine better, but sometimes it's just really delightful on its own. And um, yeah, I, um, I, I agree with you. Sometimes you just want to drink the wine and you don't want to change the taste because it's so good just to kind of write as is. By the way, if you're eating, um, if you've got the chef's board, uh, I would highly recommend this wine with the Fontina if you would like to try that, if you still have some left. So just so you guys know, the, the chef I'm working with now, the chef's board we're really creating to like cultivate the best pairing possible for the class wines that I'm picking on the weekend. So if you've ever wondered what the deal is with that one, we pick out the cheeses uh, specifically to go with the wines that I'm featuring for the weekends. All right, uh, Chris says the clarity is nice and the nose is really clean, oh, sorry, very clean with the nice red and blue fruit. I like that blue fruit call too, great. Acid is good, the tannins have a good grippy feeling. Yeah, so even though the wine wasn't aged in oak and all, we still get those grippy tannins and that's from the extra thick skins of the grape. The smell and the taste were so different to us. Actually, I need to taste it, let's see. Not using a spit cup for that one. Yeah, it's true. The nose has all these um, plums, just loads and loads and loads of plums, very purple on the nose to me. And then the palate, I get that purple, but that is tannins and that grippy minerality just kind of grabs you by the mouth all in it. It just won't let you go. So for a light everyday, Easy drinking red. This wine is not boring at all. There's quite a lot going on. Food pairing ideas. This is like a petroleum element on the nose. Oh, interesting. Um, so food pairings for this one, you know, I went simple with this one. That's gonna bring out kind of the fun flavors. I went like carnitas tacos and um, um, you know, roast beef sandwiches with like a little bit of horseradish uh, creme sauce on there. Uh, I went. I want some meat, but I want it to be kind of like low key, almost like street food style is kind of how I want. I think it would, it would play up the flirtatious fun nature of this wine <clears throat> without making it overly serious, which we'll definitely get to with the next ones. So Rick says, drink with some roasted chicken or similar fowl. Yes, absolutely this wine could go with chicken. This wine could also stand with a slight chill on it. If you're one of those people that likes red wine with a slight chill, Always avoid oaked red wines when you do that because that's going to diminish all the flavors of the wine except for the oak. <laughs> so it just tastes like oak chips, oak chips in your in your mouth. Amanda says this wine is really good with dark chocolate. All right, brings out a whole new flavor of coffee and dark cherries. Love that call. Uh, like it with the mimolette. Wonderful that cheese fond. Okay. Um, all right, and Tawana says you made carnitas for talk for dinner tonight. That was fabulous. I should have picked some up. Um, sounds amazing. All right, so hopefully you'll love dolcetto. Has anyone ever had dolcetto before? Is that a wine that you that you drink frequently at all, or is this kind of a new wine to everyone? I know the green Alino is probably very new to most people, but the dolcetto, I figured that. Maybe at least if it's not one of your go-tos, you've had it before a couple of times or seen it on restaurant wine list or in wine stores. So we are going to go next. I know I'm like speeding through this a little bit. I just don't want to hold everyone all night long. And we still have three wines to taste in front of us. So we're going to try next the Albino Roca. So a CH in Italy is a hard C sound. So C. Um, a single C is a CH sound, and a CC is also a hard C sound. So Roca is how this is pronounced. But if it were one C, it would be Rocha, and if it were CH, it would be Roca again. So 
again, confusing, but Albino Roca is the name of the like founding father of this estate, the grandfather that started this estate back in the 60s. So this is the one we're going to try next. Barbera is the name of the grape. And remember, if it's something and then D apostrophe something else, the first is always the grape. And D apostrophe from the city or village or township of the second one. So Alba. So the two cities in Piedmont that we were talking about, Asti and Alba. This is from Alba. This is superiore, which means, again, indication of higher levels of oak aging or aging in general. Throughout all of Italy, that's kind of what you can count on for that. Jepin is how this is pronounced. Jepin is the name of this label. So not the vineyard, not the hill, not the town, but just like this label of wine. It's coming from two vineyards, one planted in the 1950s, one planted in the 1970s. So we've got 50 to 75-year-old vines on this. And the wine is from 2017 vintage. This is the wine. I will start uh, taking messages and emails now. If you taste this and like it, there are six bottles available. That is it. Um, and I can't discount the price further because that is the discounted price. So only two, two cases came into this area at all. Um, and there's about half of, half of the case one and a half cases gone for you all to taste this one. So taste it and immediately first come, first serve. Now I'm, I'm doing one bottle per person. Obviously someone can't just come in and uh, snag all six bottles, but just fair warning, you have been warned. Um, all right, let's get our noses in this Barbera. While y'all are smelling and tasting the Barbera, whoo. All right, I can't wait, hold on. Oh my heavens. <laughs> All right, that's just good. That's just really good. All right, so Barbera. So remember, Nebula is the, the king of Piedmont, the masculine, really kind of rough around the edges, structured wine that could last for decades upon decades. Barbera is the queen. She takes all of the intensity, but adds some elegance, some round fruits, makes a little bit more um, approachable, silkier fruits, styles, very just very different textural components, obviously different grapes, but very different personalities as well and general structures to the wine. So Albita Roca, uh, he was the grandfather. He started the estate in the 1960s. They have a longer history as a family in the winemaking world, but generally made wine or grew, wines, uh, grew grapes for other people. So he started his own family estate in the 60s and has passed down. His son, Angelo, um, then took over. Um, he has since passed away in a tragic accident, um, but right now his three daughters and son-in-laws have taken over the business. So now they're third generation in this actual estate that was started by their grandfather whom the wine was named after, but they have about a hundred plus years of history of this family in this practice. So the previous owner of these two vineyards that they have uh, gotten this wine from was named Jepin. So that is what this, this wine is named after, the owner of these two vineyards. So they start this estate, it's a small estate, and then as they grow, they start purchasing vineyards of other places. So throughout Piedmont, it's also... Piedmont is different than the rest of Italy for this other reason that you have these small family estates that are, I mean, tiny little parcels like you have in Burgundy, uh, France, where this family owns two rows of this vineyard and this family owns two rows and they have to pool their resources together to create a joint wine. So in Piedmont specifically, you have a lot of the same style of um, estates. So as, as winemakers, um, uh, and, and owners of these estates and, and vineyards, as they get older, and if their children do not want to take over the family business, now we're starting to see estates get a little bit bigger in this area as people are like, all right, well, if you don't have anyone to give this to, I will buy it from you. And so the people are starting to grow their estates. So we're seeing a little bit more of a, now, now this is a grown estate, but it's still by far a tiny little boutique um, producer. Of this particular wine, less than 400 cases total of this wine were produced. So um, as they're growing, they're buying these two vineyards. They bought the vineyards from this man, Japin. 
Jacqueline Gibson vineyards, they named the wine after him. These vineyards were harvested and were planted and harvested and intended by Japine from, again, the 1970s, 1950s and 1970s on. So really just interesting how, how the families are collaborating to make bigger wine. This uh, is a superiori, so it was aged for 12 months in oak. Now, for most of the world, when we talk about oak, there are two types of oak that we think of, French and American. In this area, but throughout a lot of Italy, you don't really see lots of French oak. It's kind of a newer thing in the last century. Um, but you see a lot of Slovenian oak and Hungarian oak. So further south, you see a lot more Hungarian oak. Further north, you see a lot of Slovenian oak. And so that is very traditional in this area. In fact, in like the 70s and 80s, as people are starting to learn more modern winemaking techniques, especially 80s into the 90s, now it starts being almost like a soap opera in, uh, in throughout lots of Italy, but especially in this area that had such a high reputation for the quality of their wines in Piedmont. And so families are torn asunder as it's going from generation to generation. So say some mom has actually Vinoculture's her baby project. And as I've taken over the family business of Vinoculture, I've changed what we're doing. We're doing virtual classes now. And, and some mom's like, that's too modern. We can't do that. But instead of just becoming like a family fight, what's happening in these families of generations of winemakers in Piedmont is that they're literally excommunicating family members. Mm -hmm. So these estates that are growing as people are buying up new, uh, new vineyards and stuff like that, now they're being split apart because um, I'm never gonna work with you. I'm never gonna agree with your style of winemaking practices. How dare you think about using French oak? Uh, you know, this kind of style of really intense existential crisis, basically. What is the meaning of Piedmont wines? What do we stand for? This is in our blood. This is our tradition. This is our family. You never go against the family. Um, and so it was a really big deal. So all that to say is whenever you see them on technical sheets of wines from Italy, if you ever see French oak, know that there is a dramatic story behind that. This, they still operate very traditionally. Now, finally, we're at the point where modern winemakers are like, all right, we don't have to throw away all of the tradition. We can still, we, we have a lot to learn. We don't want to throw all, away all the tradition. We like what that brings to us, but we can do it better. We can, do, we can make these wines that don't have to be aged for 15 years before they're acceptable to drink. And now finally the older generation's like, all right, I'll give it to you. That French oak does something different to the wine. And so we're really seeing finally kind of a, um, uh, I wanna say subduction, that's not the word, a subduing of the drama, of the family drama between uh, generations of traditionalist versus the modernist. Um, but this one, they're still making wines very traditionally using German and Austrian oak casks, actually. Very, very large oak casks. I don't think like a barrel. It's a little barrel, you know, in, in Pier 1 to decorate your house with. That is uh, what we call barrique, uh, French oak style. That's about 225 liters. Some of these huge casks that you're using, you're using in this area are like 40 hectoliters. 9,000 liters over here. 7,000 over here. 40, like massive barrels that you could live in. That's how big they are. Um, very different style of the wine that's produced in that versus a little small uh, French oak barrel. So different style. This is German and Austrian oak casks. Don't be scared. All right, let's, let's see what we're tasting in this wine. <sighs> oh. All right, look through the notes here. Great to see that other people have had some um, some dolcettos. Also really cool to see that there's a dolcetto is a new grape for some people. I uh, love, love, love trying new grapes. There are thousands of grapes in the world and I think most of what we drink, especially here in the United States, can be boiled down to 10 grapes. And so just to expand horizons and try new grapes is one of my favorite things, so. Um, and great, great note. Sorry to keep going back to the dolcetto. I'm just getting to the chat room here. Chris says different than other dolcettos, not as fruity. Yes. Doliani makes serious dolcettos. Every winemaker in 
in Piedmont probably makes the dolcetto. Most of them are like fruity, soft, super flirtatious. This dolcetto or dolcettos in general from Doliani are, are taken a little bit more seriously. They're like the, um, not the little sister in, um, in middle school or high school. This is like the sister like going for her master's degree, but she's only 17, you know, that kind of um, young still, but a little, a little bit more intense. So, all right. Um, Chris says this diesel fuel warm and so nice on the nose. I hope the diesel is like a good thing and has depth. Wonderful. Yes. Much bolder on the nose and the palate get dried cherries and plums soaked in sherry and spooned on a flaky biscuit. I like that. Um, good pop call, Papa. Let's see. Classic family drama. Yes. Yes, it's, it's so true. There's so much drama. And then you get the Italians. Can you just like see them too? Like these Italian families, like ba -da -ba -da, ba -da -ba -da, just like yelling at each other all about oak. And I, I just, I can just visualize this in my head. So Amanda says, get the diesel fuel smell. Okay. So, so does anyone else get diesel fuel? My wine has been open since last night because I wanted to open it last night. So if y'all are getting to so fuel now, I probably could have gotten that last night, maybe when my wine was open more, but um, it has now been open for a while. Um, the family put the fun in dysfunctional. Yes, there we go. Um, the development raisins and dried fruit on this wine is great. Very mature for such a young wine. Yeah, this wine, all of these wines are literally just landed, just released. 2017, so we got, what, three and a half years on it, but still, these wines just, you know, went from barrel to bottle, rested in the bottle for a little bit, shipped across the U.S., and now they're in our glasses, so definitely a young wine. Matt says it tastes more like toast than it smells like toast. Interesting. All right. So Rick says, we poured three to five at noon today. I love it. The Barbera is dark and purple and had a nose of young, grapey wine much different than six hours in the glass. It is crazy what oxygen does to wine. Mm -hmm. It just really is dramatically, even in a little bit. So I always put all of my glasses out so I can keep tasting them and don't have to worry about which wine is which. And even as I do these virtual classes, going back to the wines at the end of the class, they smell radically different just in that little bit, not even in big decanter, just in my glass for an hour. Alcohol is so warming and I seriously cannot get enough. Yes, the diesel is a good thing. Okay, cool. Um, we opened one and two last night. Diesel on the nose for number three. Okay, great. I don't get it. But again, my wine's been open for a lot longer. So it's probably just that. But as long as it's a good thing, then I am happy with it. I, so the difference to me now is we start getting away from rustic. And now we start getting, approaching serious elegance and finesse. So the first two wines were rustic. The flavors were a little kind of all over the place. They're kind of jumping around. They're kind of like me uh, on some coffee. They're, they're just kind of all over the place. A little wild, definitely not settled down. As soon as we start getting into this bear, uh, Barbera, it's like everything slows down and becomes more elegant and smooth and graceful and put together. There's just a, to me, a dramatic difference. Now I love all of them, right? I love each and every one of them, but they, there's a dramatic difference in composure, elegance and grace once we get to this wine that will hopefully just increase uh, for us. But really, really enjoying the texture of this. It's velvety, but not plush and weighty. You know, sometimes wines just kind of weigh you down. So, oh uh, man, do y'all like it? Some of them, some pop? Okay, I like it. My mom's just like, yes, we love it. All right, good. Glad you like it. I see my phone going a little crazy, so I'm guessing that we've sold them all now, but um, I'll, I'll confirm everyone's orders after the class. I don't want it to be like an auction. I just wanted to give everyone the chance that wanted the wine. Do, do fair notice that the, the wine was in very limited supply. All right, so we've gone from Green Elena to Dolcetto, to Barbera. Now we're gonna try one Nebbiolo if you got the regular four pack and if you've got the second, the, the, the Barolo, if you added on the Barolo, feel free to pour two wines side by side. If you wanna taste them side by side, you couldn't get more different styles of Nebbiolo if you tried. So it's really not a super fair comparison, 
but it's a fun comparison. Um, so we're going to try um, the auction could be an interesting twist. Yeah. You know, but I've, I have attended, uh, believe it or not, like a lot of wine classes taught by other people or wine events taught by other people. And I always hated when the, 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 sh the focus of the event shifts away from the enjoyment of the wine and the education of the wine, learning about everything to sell, sell, sell. To me, it, it, it cheapened the whole experience, but but, you know, we could just do a class that's just a wine auction. We just taste all these amazing, very limited quality wines and, and, and first come, first serve. It could, it, could, it could be an interesting thing for sure. All right. So we're going to try next Nebbiolo, baby. And this is from Boca. Um, this is the Le Piani is the name of the actual producer. The region is Boca. And the reason I picked this to feature Nebbiolo instead of a classical Barolo for the for the original four pack is because no one has ever heard of Boca and they're like these forgotten very old crazy vines and these radical visionaries go to Boca in what year was it they went there um mid 90s um there was an enologist Alexander Trolf uh, definitely not Italian and Christoph Knudzi I'm not really sure you say that either. They partner together and they're just traveling through and they stumble upon these old vines in Boca. And they're like, what the hell? Why has everyone just forgotten about these things? These look amazing. So they boast like the oldest history for Nebbiolo grapes. And uh, so while, while Barolo definitely has the most fame and notoriety, Boca's like, I kind of did it first before it was cool. That's kind of what Boca's saying. So where is Boca? Let's get to our maps here. Boca, very, very far north here. So this green area is where Barolo comes from. Um, this green area is also where a lot of other wines come from. Remember each region's kind of like layered on top of each other. But Boca is kind of nestled further up into the mountains. And remember if we were talking about volcanic soil deposits throughout Piedmont, Boca is extremely volcanic in this area versus Barolo has very little to few um, volcanic deposits, mostly clay, limestone, and sandy soils. But Boca is pretty volcanic. So you have some old vines in uh, this area and let's see. So what happens is these, so go ahead and pour yourself a glass, get your noses in there, swirl this baby because it will develop with some air if you haven't decanted it. This is the one I said, decant it if possible because it's just going to change so much. But if you didn't have a decanter, don't have time, totally understand. It will be fine. Just keep swirling that glass. So these two, these two visionaries go to this area, find these vines. They love it. And most of the vineyards are just kind of like overgrown and just not taken care of for years. They find this old man, Antonio Cherry. Um, he was this 80 year old man who had no one to pass down his vineyards to. He didn't even sell them the vineyards and the cellar. He just gave it to them along with the cellar with all of his old vintages and stuff like that. So this just, this old man has just been kind of lonely hermit up in Boca tending to his vineyards, making this incredible wine that kind of no one knows about. So he just gives the vineyards. It's only 1.5 acres. So very, very tiny, uh, tiny vineyards. To these two gentlemen and they they take that and they start slowly renovating all of these surrounding vineyards that had just been forgotten about overgrown and if you if you you know virginia right we have virginia creeper here the vine that's just a parasite and kills everything that it touches vines no matter what are invasive species they're just going to take over the world one day and um that's that's just kind of what it does so it, vines left unpruned untended vineyards are just gonna go berserk. And so it took crazy amounts of manual labor. No tractors up here. Mountains are way too, we're way too hilly mountainous area to use any tractors or equipment at all. Everything done by hand, mostly by just a couple of people. Just wild the amount of work that it takes to go into this. So another tragic death, unfortunately, Alexander um, never got to see like the full fruits of his labors. But um, their estate now went from 1.5 acres or hectares, sorry, to eight hectares now. So from the mid 90s, what, 20, 30, oh man, 25 years it takes them to go from 1.5 hectares 
to eight hectares because they're just clearing it by land. But they're also not trying to be like this massive estate. And they're trying to find these really old vines that are worth saving. So really interesting. Five hectares of those are those really old vines. Like, I don't know exactly how old. They don't know exactly how old. But they can just tell from the vine structure themselves that they are very old. Nebbiolo from here, specifically Le Piane. Oh, my gosh. Some of the most elegant wines ever. I got to... Um, um, we will have, I will email everyone after this. They um, just released. So 2015 mm -hmm. is their current release of this wine right now. But 2013, they're now releasing that they've held for this whole time because 13 just was a more intense year. They thought the wine needed more aging, so they didn't want to release it yet. So in, 2000, in, in this year, 2021, they're releasing the 2013 in just a couple months. So everyone will, who's a part of this class will get the first email, the first dibs on that wine. If you're interested in this wine and starting maybe a little, a little vertical, a little collection of different vintages of this wine. So this area um, is not 100% Nebbiolo. We're 85% Nebbiolo here and 15% Vespolina is a local indigenous grape variety. Again, not really grown anywhere else except in Lombardy where they also blend it with, uh, with Nebbiolo to make these uh, really, really delightful reds. This wine spends three to four years, depending on the vintage, the winemaker will choose to age it longer or shorter in oak before it goes into bottle and then in bottle for a year before it's released. So this wine spends some serious time in the winery before the winemaker is like, all right, I'm ready for you to graduate and go out into the world and turn people on to the beauty of Boca. So we get to try this. 2015 was a warmer year across the board. 2014 was pretty rainy and cool. 15 was a warmer year. So we have kind of a brightness of fruit to this wine. But if you notice, we did not continue up in terms of intensity of flavor and loudness of flavor and bigness of fruits and, um, and richness of mouthfeel. So we, we were going up for the first three and now we've dropped down dramatically in terms of intensity. So we're getting quieter now. The elegance has increased, the complexity and balance is increasing. But the loudness of the wine, it's its quietly whispering to you how beautiful the history of Nebbiolo is in Boca and these old vines. And um, But it's not a bold, in-your-face wine. Pure elegance and romance and poetry in a glass. If you can't tell, <laughs> I really like this wine. But you get your noses in there, taste this wine. Tell me what you're experiencing. I can't wait to try this now that it's been hanging out in my glass for the last two hours. Whew. Oh my word. I could just sit here and smell this wine for another hour and not even need to take a sip. Um, great question. Is Vespolina white or red? It is a red grape Vespolina. Um, in Lombardy, it's also blended with Croatina um, and Nebbiolo to make these uh, really delightful blends that um, I can also recommend uh, you as well. But um, question, uh, Rick says, when we first opened this wine, it had a lighter color. Can the color darken with oxygen? Usually red wine will lose pigment with oxygen and that happens over years. So the color darkening probably has to do with lighting. You know, it's gotten a lot darker. Um, so depending on your actual lighting, I think that that has more to do with it, um, than anything else because oxygen to change the pigment of the wine takes years in the bottle to really do that uh, rather than just kind of in the glass. But great question. I like that. It's interesting that the color changed. Um, let's see. The Boca is so refined. Might be the favorite of the night. I agree with you. I like wouldn't kick any of these out of bed for eating crackers, but this wine. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Let's see here. Tried to research Boca and couldn't find hardly anything. Yeah, there's very few people who are brave enough to uh, make wine in this area. So, by the way, this area, this whole area here is called Alto Piemonte or Upper Piedmont. And very different style than Lower Piedmont here. This is where all of your classic wines, like if you go to Total Wine or something like that and go in there, Italian wine section, find the wines from Piedmont, you won't find any of the wines from up here because it's way more rural. Um, Everything's higher elevation, steeper cliffs, so they're just not making as much wine. Nothing is done in 
large enough format or um, big enough quantities to really make it out there. And so there's just, yeah, not a lot of information there. Even when you go to their website, um, the English site is always half down and I can't get the information about the wine. So I don't have as much information on this on this wine. So, so different on the nose. Yes, this wine is, is so different and unique. I'm definitely getting ash on the nose initially. So that is, could be, now if you remember from the soil series classes, we don't know why we smell soil sometimes, but we do, but technically there's no scientific explanation. But yeah, I often get volcanic ash um, on, 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 on some wines like this. So let's see, the more on a swirl, the more ash it gets, starting to get some dried cherries and spice. Interesting. Um, Acid comes through on the nose. The subtle smoke and bright fruit are so wonderful. Fully agree. I smell red cherry and leather. I like it. So you get this like fruit and um, and so you get like this feminine and masculine component on this. Um, and some green pepper. Yeah, I like that. There's honestly so much going on. But again, there's, there's such softer notes for sure. We decanted ours per your instructions. It is amazing. Good. I'm so glad you got to kind of see the full expression of the wine. If you don't finish it tonight, put a cork back on it. It will continue to taste good for the next three, four days, honestly. While all of these wines have enough acid and tannins in them and lower in alcohol content that they will be fine for the next several days, um, even without a special uh, enclosure or using a Corvin or anything like that. Um, my cherries like craisins, but with cherries. So a little bit more of that tart red fruit, awesome. Seville, this is an elegant, beautiful woman. Maybe Jacques Onassis? Jackie Onassis. I don't know who that is. Oh, Jackie O. Sorry, <laughs> I've never. <laughs> I didn't actually know that that's how you uh, spelled her last name. Oh, my gosh. I probably knew this if I wasn't thinking about wine. Anyways, embarrassing now. Jackie O. Great. Yes, absolutely. All class, right? Um, salivating over a reduction of Bing cherries with the wine served over vanilla bean ice cream. Wait, are you actually pairing this with vanilla bean ice cream? I am so intrigued how that pairing is. I feel like this, or are you just getting like that vanilla bean characteristic in the wine? Please elaborate from that. Um, three or four days, it won't last another 10 minutes. You're right. If you're like me and, um, I did an earlier virtual event. Um, this afternoon and I did this new segment where I opened up three bottles of wine this morning. So right now in my house, there's like a dozen bottles of open wine. So if uh, anyone runs out, just knock on my door. I will, uh, I will give you some more wine for sure. Um, whew, man, let's taste. I get this, um, graphite -y pencil shavings kind of character characteristic to the wine that for lighter style reds is always one of my favorite aspects of this wine. It kind of gives this um, textural movement to the wine. It's like this dynamicism, if that's how you pronounce it, on, on the palate that I just really, really enjoy. It's just, um, ah, it's so dynamic, it's so vibrant and elegant, and I just can't wait to see what this wine's gonna taste like in 10 years. I, again, I don't know if I can wait that long, but I'm gonna try, I'm gonna buy a few bottles. I always like to, I have verticals of this particular wine since 09. And so going back and, and tasting them, the wines are just so amazing. And so, but my biggest mistake was always not buying enough so that it lasted because after a year, you wanna taste it again, and if you only got two bottles, then ah! So um, th this is probably the year that I start building back up my collection because over COVID, I drank all of my collection of those good wines. So Carrie says, no, he's fantasizing about likening this wine to a fine culinary wine reduction. Okay, I was really confused if you were actually drinking this wine with vanilla ice cream because when you drink red wine with something sweeter, say sweet chocolate instead of bitter chocolate, it accentuates the bitter notes in wine. And this wine has some pretty bitter notes in it, right? Even though it's got these like floral notes and fruit notes, those tannins are intense and pretty bitter. So if you if you drink with something sweet, then it's just gonna make the wines intensely bitter. So I really want this with some braised like short ribs over um, 
you know, uh, oh, remember mom when you made those blue cheese grits <laughs> that one time, so short ribs over blue cheese grits. I think this would be a spectacular pairing. It would be really amazing. So um, braised meats for sure, risottos, anything with truffle on it, um, anything with a cream sauce, anything kind of richer, denser would be fabulous. So if y'all are um, still hanging with me and still want to taste that Barolo, we're going to open that up next and or hopefully it's already open and try that out. I won't talk too much, too much about this since I know um, we are running a little bit later than we normally do. Um, but this wine is from Alessandro Velio. So again, that G is silent sometimes, but not always, but here it is, Alessandro Velio. Um, and it is from the region of Barolo, um, or as they would say, the Barolo. So uh, say that with me now. Hopefully you're tipsy enough to try this at home with your friends. Barolo. Um, and it's the 2016 vintage. So 2016 is this epic vintage that all the wine readers, so first of all, 2015, everyone's like, this is the year, this is the year. Now 2016, they're like, forget about 2015. This is the year. So all these wine readers are like, this is, this is the most amazing year for Barolo or Barolo that we have had in recent history. So wild to see that, yes, climate change is changing where we start looking about planting future vineyards. But for right now, Nebbiolo, that's a late harvest or late ripening grape. It often really struggles to ripen all the way before it's time to harvest it because it's winter and the grapes are going to get frosted and be ruined. Now, because we're having warmer vintages, we were able to get these grapes ripened earlier and ripen fully in time before there's ever a threat of frost or um, hail is also a big thing in this area. In fact, Nebbiolo um, comes from the, the, the word for Nebbi, which uh, means fog. So this late fog that or in late October, about the time of harvesting season, fog rolls in all the time and kind of just like chills down. Imagine like how gloomy it's been the last few days. The raining, as my dad says, it's going to rain until eternity. It's, um, it's, it's foggy and it just kind of sits in the vineyard. It's kind of chilling everything down. So it dumbs down and slows down almost to this snail's pace, the last little bit of ripening. So if you can't get it ripened by the time that fog is rolling in, there's a chance it might not ripen at all once that fog kind of sets in. So what happened back in the day, go ahead, by the way, uh, start drinking this wine. Back in the day, back before they figured out some of these modern winemaking practices, um, if you just use indigenous yeast, and by that I mean the yeast that's ambient in the air, native to the, to the region, hanging out on the grapes themselves, you're not adding yeast to ferment the wine. If you're just using indigenous native ambient yeast, in the fermentation process, that's very uh, sensitive to temperature fluctuations. So if it gets too cold, like below 50 degrees, certain yeast strands will just go dormant and fall asleep basically until it warms back up. So they wait so long to harvest these Nebbiolo grapes and because they, they're trying to get them as ripe as possible. And then they start fermentation process and these are in cellars without heaters, space heaters or anything like that. So the cellars are getting too cold. So the yeast is not staying active. So fermentation in these cellars each year stalls. And sometimes it takes what, what now takes only four weeks because we, we understand how yeast works and we can add cultured yeast to make sure that, that we don't have stalled fermentations. Takes sometimes six months. And so while it's all in barrel on the skins, because you can't take it off the skins and keep the fermentation going, these wines are sitting out on the skins, not for four weeks like is normal, but for six, seven months sometimes, which means that you get these wines that just taste like grape seeds and grape skins, all the bitter components, all the intense tannins from not just the skins and seeds that it's been hanging out with for six months, but also the oak that the wine was aged in. So, and then the wine, they aged it for years and years on oak, sometimes to oxidize it so that it softens the tannins. Again, bizarre winemaking practices that we think of now were very traditional in this area, which is why these wines were not acceptable to drink earlier than 10 to 15 years old. 
because the tannins had to soften and tannins soften with age in the bottle. But now that we're understanding how fermentation works, grapes are ripening earlier, so we're not stalling. We can use space heaters. If you're gonna use ambient yeast, you can use space heaters to make sure the temperature stays high enough so that the ambient yeast doesn't go to sleep. All of these little ticks, tips and tricks that we know now are making Barolos that yes, can age for decades, but don't have to before they are ready to be consumed. 2016, perfect year. Alessandro Bellio, <laughs> out of all of the wines that we've had where I'm like this, they've been dating back to the 11th century here and 150 years here. He's a first generation winemaker. So this is the first wine of like the new kid on the block. Um, he's a young guy. I think he's like in the early 30s or something like that. Someone find out if he's single, you know, because his wines are delicious. I haven't met him yet, but plan to one day. Um, and he's definitely making wines in a little bit more of a modern style, a little bit more of a yes, we kind of hone the tradition of the land and we want to stay true and authentic to who we are. But I'm also making wines that Americans will like to drink. Um, and that's so serious, not something that needs to be aged for, yeah, 10, 15 years before it's enjoyable. So I've always loved his wines. I have given y'all in certain six packs before his dolcettos that are made in like a really lovely fruit forward way. Um, and this is the 2016 that just rolled out. There's a lot of 2016s. Again, you don't make a 2016 Barolo that didn't get high ratings, um, but there's a lot of 16s that aren't yet released or if they are, because it was such a great year, they made wine that you shouldn't touch for five years. But his wine is a pop and pour and enjoy wine, which I really, really appreciate. Tell me what y'all think about this 2016 Farolo. Mm. Y'all deserve some good wine because I have chatted your ear off tonight. I think this is the most information I've ever given in a, in a single class. So thank y'all for sticking with me with all this and learning about these amazing wines. Um, all right. So unrelated to wine, but love your glasses. Oh, thanks. Um, Warby Parker, everything's online these days. So fabulous. You can even do like these like tests online to refill your prescription and stuff. It's great. Um, Rick, Julie found vanilla bean on the nose. Okay, awesome. So I like that, that y'all agreed on the culinary aspect of what this, what food this wine reminded you of to what you're actually getting in the wine. It's fabulous. Um, smells like something is baking. Yeah, I love it with this wine, so luscious. Yes, after the intense acidity of the last wine, um, this wine kind of harkens back to the textural components of that Barbera, that a little bit more velvety, plush style of fruit on the palate. Um, Gary says, oh yeah, he is single. <laughs> That's hysterical. I, I, I wasn't taking myself seriously then, but now I've gotten myself into trouble. Um, I agree, Amanda. I was going to say a jammy fruit tart with hint of mint. I love it. I love it. Um, mint. Let's see here. Oh, yeah. There's almost this like hay, like hay bale kind of characteristic to the wine too. So, but like not in a rotting way, not like barnyard hay, just um, the fall, you know, when you smell the, and the tractors are kind of putting those hay bales up together. The acid rivals the tannins. This wine, this is amazing juice, truly pop and rock wine. I like it. Yeah, high tannins, high acid, but not to the point where it's unpleasant or like, oh, this baby needs some food. It will, it will be amazing with food, but it's not unapproachable. I love how approachable um, this um, Alessandro Valio Barolo is. Um, can't wait for the next class. Awesome. Yeah. Whew. Man. All right. So we've had four, maybe five wines. Maybe you just opened up one bottle. Totally cool. What's one thing you are going to take away from this class in terms of Maybe looking for Piedmont wines on a wine list at a restaurant instead of just buying your California wine sections. Maybe thinking about Italian wines a little bit differently, not just Chianti and wines to pair with pizza and pasta and stuff like this. Um, maybe thinking about wines to age. Is there anything from this class you're going to take away a little bit more um, or maybe just one wine that that knocked your socks off that you're still thinking about after after all these wines. Love to hear your final notes on this wine. 
And while y'all type those out, uh, a reminder, every Saturday now, we are doing wine classes. I'm about to put out my class schedule for March. I'm just waiting on um, a winemaker from California to finalize the date that we're going to do a Meet the Winemaker class in March. So he's from California. Um, it's the makers of Lioga. So we featured their wines before. They focus on Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and some other varietals uh, that are fun, like Carignan um, and some other fun stuff. So really delightful wines. Cannot wait to get in. This will be our first California Meet the Winemaker class. So every Saturday, I would love to be your Saturday date night. Um, and, um, and just keep that on your schedule anytime you're interested. Let me know. So... Cora and Jake says the areas of Piedmont, that's going to be your takeaway. Yeah, it's not just all one thing. You get so it's so many diverse areas. So always order the Grignolino. I like that that's your takeaway. I love it. Love the first wine the best, the Grignolino. That was uh, that's amazing. Um, I can't wait to tell the winemaker that. While y'all finished you, I forgot my last thing about importers. Remember how we were talking about the three tier distribution state? Turn over to the back label on all the wines. Notice the importers. If you find something that you really like, a wine that you really like, always look at the back label. Back label will usually have the information on the importer. So the first wine is the Piedmont guy. He obviously only works with wines from Piedmont. Um, and so when you're shopping, especially at a wine store where you can like look at the back labels, once you kind of get a handle of, oh my gosh, everything that Mark de Grazia imports that's a Marc de Grazia selection he only does Italian wine everything he does I've just like really loved and been totally floored by so when you go shopping flip over to the back label and even if it's wine you've never heard of and have no idea if you're gonna like if it's that same importer chances are you could actually be 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 um having a high chance that you're gonna really enjoy that wine so um sorry that that was the last thing I wanted to throw out there Makes me want to buy a whole case of Piedmont wines and focus on them for a month. Yeah, I like that. I like that. It makes me realize that I need to experience a lot more grapes that are out there because I'm probably missing out on some amazing wines. You know, that's, that's the beauty of this world. There's always the next wine to taste, and uh, it makes my job real fun. Kevin and I want to go on an Italy trip tour. with. Yeah, as soon as we can travel, I will take someone to Italy, Spain, South Africa, anywhere in this world i can't wait to travel so i'll pay the ticket for whoever introduces you to alessandro oh Mario. mom says uh she will pay for the plane ticket for anyone who introduces me to alessandro Velio. i don't think that's because she wants to marry me off i think she just wants a connection to this one <laughs> so um all right the green alina was a pleasant discovery yes more wines than just chianti yes if you talk here into hosting the trip we'll join you I'm down. I'm totally down. Um, this last year I was supposed to take a six couple or six people, three couples on a tasting trip through Bordeaux, France. And alas, we will get to travel again one day soon. I can't wait to do that. Thank you all so much for tuning in to this um, incredibly nerdy breakdown of these awesome wines. Um, please remember like these wines don't advertise to everyone the price that you're getting because I can't afford to give everyone the prices of those, but they are for you. So please let me know and I can get these wines to you shortly. If you're one of the lucky six to get the Barberas, I already have those. The rest might take a week or so to get in. So thank you all. I look forward to seeing you again on another Saturday. Please let me know if you have any other ideas for future classes now that I'm finalizing my schedule for March and April. Let me know. I am I am I'm here to serve the wines that you're actually interested in. So if there's a region or a type of grape or a specific producer that you'd like to know more about, please let me know. Until I see you again, cheers with some Grignolino or some Barbera or some Dolcetto or some Nebbiolos. I'll see you later, y'all. Bye.